we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Stink Tech. And uh, we're here on a given Monday afternoon. And uh, we're, we're doing a community matters show uh, with Anna, Anna Nubar. And uh, at my, my, my puppy is actually helping us out today. And that's, that's totally appropriate because this is about the Hawaiian Humane Society. Hi, Anna. Thank you for Hi, doing Jay. the show with me. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And it is perfect that your dog is in the background. <laughs> well, I, I cannot explain in the, in the English language how much I love my puppy. It's, oh. uh, it's an all day, 24 by seven experience for me. Life would not be, would not be worth living without her, I tell you the truth. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, um, so this, this goes to what, what's happening with the Humane Society. And I, I would like to cover it because it, you know, it's a phenomenon, it's, it's rooted in, in COVID, and uh, it's important that everybody in the community yeah. understands all the vectors and all the you know the things that play in your in your moving 600 animals from various humane society facilities in the state uh, to the mainland. So that's big news. Uh, can yeah. you talk about what is happening and how it is being accomplished? Absolutely. So this is a huge collaborative effort. Um, with Greater Good Charities and Wings of Rescue alongside our um, Hawaii Island partners with Maui Humane, Kauai, Hawaii Island, and Lanai Cat Sanctuary and Kauai ASPCA. So large, large volume of animals, cats and dogs only, mostly cats. Um, as everyone knows here in Hawaii, we have um, an overpopulation of cats in particular. And so this is a direct result of, of COVID for this flight. And so what this collaboration is doing is aiming to relocate about 600 animals over to the mainland to shelters on the West Coast. Um, these are animals that, that have been at the various Humane Society facilities around the islands uh, waiting adoption. Is that it? That is correct. Yeah. So um, kittens, cats, um, and dogs that, that have been waiting for adoption. And a lot of these agencies typically transfer to the mainland um, in routine times. And due to COVID, that has changed dramatically for many of us. So what, what's the normal process? It sounds like the normal process has been disrupted, disrupted by COVID. And that brings you, you know, to have this large number of animals that you've got to deal with. Can you talk about that? Sure. So many, many of us um, utilize transfer partners on the mainland, uh, specifically along the West Coast, but in a couple of the other states as well to relocate adoptable animals. Um, we, we don't quite have in, in all times the resources locally for as many adoptable animals as exist in the shelters. And so we utilize as just part of routine process areas of the country that have um, a much higher need for adoptable animals and we have more a supply than, than we have need here and so a transfer program is very very common across all shelters in the united states uh, and for us it's a little unique because we can't just drive them over the state line right um, so we, we have yeah. to rely on air travel um, to get them to get them to where they need to go this has happened before i, I... I take it that you have um, transferred um, animals from Hawaii to the mainland before when you, I guess you run out of space uh, for one reason or another. In this case, COVID has disrupted, mm -hmm. you know, the ordinary adoption program here. And so yeah. you wind up with too, too many animals in the same space and that's not humane, so you have to transfer them. But have you done this before? Right. We have done this before. We've, we've partnered with Hawaiian Airlines and Arizona Humane Society in the past to transfer animals um, from our shelter over to the mainland. And, and that's been so successful. And, and I know our other partner shelters um, in Hawaii have done the same thing and have many partnerships. Um, and this is a very routine process for them as well. Russ, it's uh, fabulous because uh, what, would ha what would happen if you could not do this? What would be, you know, the, so the it Im it impacts, yeah. So it impacts our ability to care for more animals out in the community, um, and so we're committed to the animals that come into us. And so these are animals um, that are are waiting for adoption, um, and in many of the shelters, and just there's not always enough people to adopt them, and so 
for us, it, it impacts our ability to help support other animals out in the community, not necessarily the animals in our shelter, but the animals that are out in the community. And, and this will help open up space and allow us to do more work with our community and the animals locally. So how, how is the uh, adoption process affected by COVID? Are people, people are reluctant to come down and, uh, and adopt, uh, let's say a baby, adopt a baby, a baby pet. Yeah, yeah. So it, it has Swear changed. Right? My baby. Yes, definitely. Um, so yeah. So for everyone, as everyone is is well aware, our our processes have changed because of COVID and and our need for socially distant behavior, um, wearing masks, our vulnerable populations within our community. Um, you know, our behaviors have changed across the board, and so we've had to adjust and adapt as an organization to, to help support the needs of the community. And so part of what we're doing now is our, our adoptions are by appointment. Um, and so we, and we're trying to really make sure that we're keeping everybody safe, not only our staff, but our community members as well. And I think because more and more people are staying at home, the different stay at home orders we've had have impacted the number of adoptions that we're seeing. And so we're, we're really hoping that as, as things continue to change and we're, we've been looking really good the last couple of weeks, um, if we continue to move into the next couple of tiers, that things will change for everyone as well. Um, but it, it impacts everybody in, in so many different ways and our adoptions have certainly felt the impact of that. Yeah, it's really too bad because the animals yeah. uh, suffer over it. You know, they need the love and affection. And, Absolutely. Uh, and, uh, waiting is hard on them. So yep. is, is it possible to do these adoptions uh, online? Is it possible to have people, you know, look at pictures or movie clips of animals and make a choice or are they reluctant? Absolutely. Absolutely. So what we try to do now is when people uh, make appointments, we have a phone conversation with them and talk about what they're interested in, um, what kind of animal they're looking for, what might be a really good match for them and really try to match them up with, with an animal that we have. If by chance we don't have the perfect match for them at the time, then we will continue to look for them. And so we may find something for them the next day or it may take us a couple of weeks, but we're gonna keep looking for them and hope to find that good match um, so we can get that animal in that forever home. Um, and, and people can and have that human animal bond that they're looking for. Oh, sure. Oh, that's fabulous yeah. that you do that. Yeah. And, and that facilitates the whole process and makes it so easy. Uh, Absolutely. And, and it's, yeah, it's uh, it's wonderful on both sides of the equation. Yeah. So let's talk about how you how you organize um, a, a 600 animal transfer to the mainland. First of all, you have like half a dozen agencies that are involved on, on, yes. in Hawaii and on the mainland. How did how did that all come together? That sounds like a lot of work. It is a tremendous amount of work, and we're very, very grateful to our partners at Greater Good Charities and Wings of Rescue for helping facilitate this. And the logistics is, is a combination of everyone working together, determining what the needs are for the air for the air travel, what the needs are for each individual animal, and what the needs are at the receiving shelters. And so working together on um, just supplies, right? Um, making sure that there's constant communication. So our teams are having meetings weekly, sometimes multiple times a week to make sure everything's in order and everyone has what they need. And then coordinating with um, either our veterinarians or, or for our, some of our partners, local veterinarians, uh, to make sure the animals have their health exams and have their health certificates prior to travel is really critical. Oh, sure, because travel in a plane and a crate for any length of time is, mm -hmm. is gonna be hard on the animals. Uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, you, you put more than one in a crate or is it only one in a crate? It's only one in a crate. We want to make sure they're comfortable. And, and a long flight like that, you know, sometimes messes can be made. So we want to make sure that animals are comfortable. So what do you give them in the crate to, you know, to keep them Yeah. Comfortable? Yeah. So we can't do a whole lot, you know, as, as much as we would love to. Um, but everybody will have water or a frozen bucket of water um, and a nice uh blanket that they can't get tangled up in, but something that's pretty flat, but comfortable. Um, so pretty plain um, in there, but they'll have exactly what they need for, for that flight. And any litters of kittens that are going will go together. And so there won't be itty bitty kittens by themselves, but litters of kittens will fly together. So that'll be nice comfort for them. Yes. And, and um, what, what about, um, let's see, food? You, you, leave them, you leave them water. And I know that's yep. above ice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Give them a real treat. 
But uh, yeah. what about what kind of food? You, you give them the appropriate food and they have a supply that will last for as long as it takes? So they'll have food before they travel and then um, they won't have food within their crate, um, again, to help reduce uh, the, the level of mess that might be made in there. Um, but then as soon as yeah. they arrive, they'll be taken care of immediately by the team that's on the ground waiting to receive them. So they'll make sure they get fed very, very quickly. Yeah, and you can't prevent them from pooping in the crate. That's gonna. That's no, gonna we happen. can't. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they they are the they are dogs process. and cats. Yeah, that's gonna be yeah part of the process. <laughs> yep, and everybody's aware of that. Um, excuse me. There must be. Uh... Um, there was a question from a viewer. So the question is: My daughter is a dog rescuer, and she posts many dogs and cats that need fostering. Do you have a Facebook page so that we can be more aware of the inventory, and would like to be able to see what's available? Yeah. So our website contains um, all of the animals that are available for adoption, and that would be I would definitely point people to check out our website at hawaiianhumane.org. Okay, Great. and you have just one more Great, question. question. Is um of you asked um does anyone is anyone afraid of getting COVID from the dogs and cats at your humane society? No, we've actually been paying attention to the research and the national conversations that are happening there, and we're not concerned about anyone getting COVID. Um, at this point, there have been no active infections of COVID-19 that have been transmitted from pets to humans, and but we're paying really close attention to that. We do know that there have been instances of animals contracting um, COVID or at least testing positive for it, um, but we've not seen any examples of humans receiving it from their pets, but we are keeping a close eye on it. But at this point, we're not concerned about that at all. That's a great question though, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Well, how do you know that a human animal has contracted COVID? Test them. How do you know? So there would be there would be testing. We we haven't had to test any animals here. We've been pretty fortunate, um, but there are laboratory tests that can be done that can determine that. So if that's if someone is concerned about that, that could happen. One of the resources that we're providing during this time right now is for people that um, perhaps don't have a family member or friend close by and they contract COVID-19 and have to be hospitalized, we're able to hold their animal for them. And we're gonna, we quarantine them for 14 days, um, just in case, um, kind of monitor for any signs and symptoms. Um, just a, again, a, a precautionary measure um, to keep the animals and, and people safe during this time. So sometimes animals, uh, you know, on airplanes, uh, they get nervous, they get nervous with the vibration. Yeah. Uh, with the sound of the engines and the like and all yeah. those things. Um, so you, do you ever give them a tranquilizer of any kind to keep their nerves down? We don't, um, and that's for a couple of, of reasons. And so um, many of the airlines um, won't allow that because there's not monitoring that's happening. Um, and every animal responds differently to those types of medications. And without active monitoring, uh, and particularly for that number of animals, um, that wouldn't be a safe practice for us to do. And so we're, we're trying to look for animals that are, are really likely to be as comfortable as possible with that process. A, a plane flight for any animal is scary, um, but there are some that are gonna do better than others. And certainly younger animals will do a little bit better. Um, animals that are not fearful will typically do a little bit better. So we're trying to find animals that meet that criteria, um, but that's a great question. So uh, I wonder if you, are there parameters here? I mean, you've indicated that, you know, young litter of kittens would be fine. That's very young. Um, yep. What about uh, older animals? What about, it sounds like COVID, what about older animals with uh, vulnerabilities and comorbidities and, and uh, existing healthcare issues? Um, yep. do, 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 do you make selections that way? We do. So we, we want to make sure that we're putting the animal's best interest at heart. And so we're really looking for animals that don't have, as you mentioned, don't have comorbidities um, where air travel would, would put them in jeopardy. And so, you know, these are typically going to be animals under the age of five, um, you know, no, definitely no um, concerns with, with heart disease, um, lung disease, things of that nature. Um, you know, an animal may have had a surgery to remove a, an injured limb, something like that, that would be okay. Um, you know, maybe re removed a mass, um, but for the most part, um, no major health concerns because of the air travel. You know, some people really love rescue animals that they, yeah. 
um, they, it's, I don't know, it's a it's sort of an altruistic kind of a person yeah. feeling. But they would yep. prefer to take an animal that's been through a hard time than an animal that's not been through a hard time. And so I'm, I'm wondering, you know, what happens on the other side? What happens when these animals arrive on the mainland? Um, what happens when they are, you know, again, up for adoption in various mm -hmm. humane society type facilities? Absolutely. That's a great question, Jay. And the, the partners that are on at the mainland um, in a couple of the different states have already been soliciting adopters for these animals. Um, and in many cases, some of the, the animals that are that are on the trip already have homes lined up, which is phenomenal. And so we anticipate that all of the animals from this transfer um, project will have be with when in homes within about two days it, at most. Um, so they're working really hard on their end to line line up new homes for the animals right away. Um, yeah, excuse before. me, you have another question from a viewer. Is um, can I make a request of an ideal dog that I want to adopt? Do you have this service? We do have that service, um, and if they would like to email info at hawaiianhumane.org, um, they will we'll get them in touch with an adoption representative for that. Great. My goodness. So when, when is this trip uh, planned? Great question. It's going to happen. It's October 28th and 29th, um, and so getting everybody ready um, really uh, over the next week uh, to make that trip. So this person who asked this question may want to adopt a, a pet that, that that is potentially on on the plane. I mean, going on the plane. Yeah. So maybe this person can, um, you know, adopt an animal that would otherwise be transferred to the mainland. Is that possible? Yeah, that would be great. We, the the more yeah, adopters we have, the the better off we are. Absolutely. Yeah. People do. People do bond up with animals. Uh, I, yes. My observation at the Humane Society is that the bond up starts almost immediately. <clears throat> that yes. as soon as you look the animal in the eye, you're smitten. Is, am yeah. I right about that or is it just me? No, I, I, it, that happens to me too. So I, <laughs> it happens to a lot of us, right? We, we make that connection almost instantly. And in some cases, before we even meet the animal, when we're, you know, we're looking at a video of the animal online, or we're looking at their picture online, there, there's something about that animal that is connecting us to them, is drawing us to them, where we want to say, I, you know, I want to know more about you. And, or, you know, you're, in some cases, you're my dog, I'm coming to get you, right? And so I always yeah. love hearing those stories when people share with me that they, they knew the first moment they saw that that was, that was their new family member, which is, it's wonderful. Yeah, and it sticks to it, it's the yep. life. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So anyway, I was gonna I was gonna ask you when it gets we talked before about what happens when the animal gets to, to the mainland to another facility and is put up for adoption there, mm -hmm. and yep. um, whether it means anything to a, an adopted person or family that the animal came from Hawaii. Do we have a special cachet in, in terms of the animals we transfer to the mainland? I think so. Everybody lo loves a Hawaiian animal. Um, so I, I think there's a little self-marketing in place um, when, with any animal that comes from Hawaii. Um, so we're, we're fortunate and uh, the animals are fortunate that, again, their, their homes are typically lined up before they get there. Will you travel on the plane? Will I? I'm not scheduled to go this round. Nope. <laughs> When you follow up with these various uh, humane societies on the mainland to see how these animals are doing. Absolutely. So what we hope to hear back are some great adoption stories um, that we can all share um, just to celebrate the success for everyone. Um, but yes, we're, we're absolutely going to be be keeping in touch and seeing how things are going and, and um, seeing if this is something that we, you know, we can all do again at, at some point. Yeah, will, will we hear about those stories? I mean, we will, uh, can yes. you and I have another discussion? You can tell me about yeah. some of those Absolutely, stories. absolutely. And, and hopefully we'll get some great pictures to go along with that. So we'd, we'd love to share those. You know, it's a, it's a great story. It's a story of caring. It's a story of, mm -hmm. it's a special Hawaii story. And, and it's a yeah. story of COVID, obviously, because COVID generates the need for this. But, um, yeah. you know, I just, uh, uh, I, I just wonder if we, if, if, you have a sense of loss 
in terms of, you know, these are animals that would ordinarily be adopted out here in Hawaii and, and, and we can't, I mean, things get in the way and we live in difficult, so difficult times. Um, and so we have to send mm -hmm. them away. There's, there's a kind of, there's a kind of loss there, isn't there? I, I think so, but I, I like to think of it as an opportunity for us to be able to to step up and help more within our community and, and with having this support allows us to do more. And so I, I, I really truly think of it as an opportunity, not only for us, but for the animals as well, and that we're going to we're going to be able to support more animals and locally um, with these support efforts um, from other groups. So we, we are really appreciative of that. So that, that does bring me to the question of uh, mm -hmm. the cost of this, the cost of flying them, the cost of preparing them, of examining them, uh, yeah. the cost of placing them. Uh, that must be a, with 600 animals, that must be uh, a real issue. Would, can you tell me about yeah. the economics here and who helps to fund the, you know, the expenses that are involved? Absolutely. So we are very blessed to be partnering with Greater Good Charities on this as they're funding this effort uh, and we could not do it without them. And so with the support of Greater Good Charities, the animals, the 600 animals from the multiple shelters are, are able to, to benefit from this. Um, and, and the shelters on the mainland are, are able to support this as well. And so there are costs associated with this, um, but because of the generosity of, of people in all communities um, greater and Greater Good Charities, we're, we're able to do this together. Good. Um, does it cost money or is somebody offering the charter flight for free? So it, it's, it's costing greater good charities money, um, but they're, they're working, working with that. And again, it's through private individuals that, that help support this effort um, to get, get these costs um, taken care of uh, be, because it is, it is a significant cost to move 600 animals um, from Hawaii to the mainland. If I wanted to help, help you out, mm -hmm. make a contribution that would, you know, fund this kind of operation, which is, you know, uh, uh, it's a lot of work, a lot of, a lot of heart. How would I do that? Yes, that's a great question. So if you're looking to, to help support Hawaiian Humane Society, please go to our website at hawaiianhumane.org. Uh, we accept donations there. You can drop by a check in person um, at our campus um, or feel free to give us a call. But again, our website's going to be the best way um, to, to show your support. Um, again, hawaiianhumane.org. And if you're looking to support the broader effort through Greater Good Charities, um, you can go to greatergood.org and, and they can help facilitate that. And if I wanted to adopt a, a pet, um, yep. I would go, as you mentioned earlier, the same website. I would go Absolutely. and I would, uh, I would put my put my expectations in that you could either find somebody, I mean, a person, yep. a dog, rather. All dogs are yeah. people, anyway. Or, or cats. <laughs> yep. And, <laughs> and match me Absolutely. up. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, so if, there, so if suppose, you didn't find yeah, what you were looking for initially, we could definitely do that. So am I right to think, Anna, that in Hawaii, there's Hawaii, you know, we, we can complain about this and that, but in Hawaii, <laughs> people are aloha, they have big hearts. And, mm -hmm. and uh, Absolutely. I, I wonder if, uh, you know, in your experience, Hawaii has a special place for pets, maybe that other, other places may not have to the same degree. Am I right? Yeah, I think there is a tremendous support for the animals in our community and there there is a tremendous spirit here um where and people care so greatly and I, you know i see i see dogs in particular you know people have their dogs in the grocery store with them or um going on walks multiple times a day you know our dogs are a part of our lives and and i, I see a tremendous number of dogs out with their people every day and i'm so so grateful for that um and and again seeing cats going into homes i, I know we have a lot of cats on our landscape but but cats are part of our families as well, and, and knowing all the people that that adopt the cats and and provide homes for them um, is just is is really heartwarming. Since they are a part of our family. Yeah, well, they are part. part Excuse of me, my you family. have a question yeah. from a viewer. Um, they ask, are you only shipping cats and dogs to the mainland, or are you shipping any other animals? I know Humane Society offers turtles sometimes. Mm -hmm. Great question. It is only cats and dogs. Okay, 
Fair enough. It's a question <laughs> of how big the animal is, too, is it? I mean, you only have so much space. Right, exactly. Uh, yeah. So uh, I was going to ask, you know, so if, if uh, indeed, people in Hawaii care a lot about animals, and they do, I mean, I, you know, in my neighborhood, everybody has, has an animal or a whole yep. house full of animals. Um, where, where does the humane society fit? I mean, what, what is the future yeah. of it? What is its place in the community? Yeah, so I think really looking at what the community needs are. Uh, we know we have a cat overpopulation problem within our community, and so focusing there. But what what our role is, is as we continue to grow and develop, is to really be that community resource um, that people can call us and ask us questions. We can help facilitate solutions to different animal welfare concerns or issues. Um, facilitate um, you know, reunifications if you have lost your pet, uh, facilitate bringing a new family member into your life, um, but really being a pet resource for the community and, and being the, the go-to place um, when people have questions or they're not sure what to do, um, really looking forward um, to, to what that looks like for the future. And again, working alongside our community as our community grows and changes, we need to grow and change along with them. Absolutely. Are, are you also charged with uh dealing with animal abuse in Hawaii? We are in, in on Oahu, we are, yes. Um, and so that's part of our role um, with our with the city and county. Um, we, we hold that contract. And so we're, we are charged with um, really overseeing the abuse, cruelty and neglect that, that occurs. And so our, our animal our, and our field service officers are, are out in the field every day helping support those needs. Is there abuse? There is. There is. Um, sometimes it's neglect. Um, oftentimes it's overt cruelty and abuse. Um, but we do see that. Um, and again, working on on it in multiple different ways. So with with each case, as well as bigger picture with legislation and things like that. Yeah. You know, well, I was actually thinking of actually thinking about this, and it's uh, it's, it's mm -hmm. hard to envision it. But I heard recently that. Um, there are dogs, maybe a lot of dogs, who mm. will lick the hand of someone who is beating it, um, yep. which is which is kind of a statement of the relationship of dogs and people. Lick Isn't the it? hand of the person, and uh, that is so that is so touching to know that dogs mm -hmm. play. I, I'm more familiar with dogs than cats. Dogs play yeah. an incredible role in dealing with us and in they allowing do. us to deal with them. Yeah goes way and back thousands tens of thousands of years absolutely absolutely and there's they are so forgiving of our faults um and and i think you know you see that in the therapy work that occurs with with dogs and humans there's so many amazing instances of, of animal assisted therapy um where our, the the animals really make a difference for us um, and change lives every single day so you're absolutely right jay yeah well okay i'm getting back to my I'm getting back to my puppy now. Uh, <laughs> I've, 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 abandoned, I've abandoned her long enough. I have to return for a smooch. Smooch, smooch, as they say. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Anna, Anna Newbauer. Thank you so much for joining us and, and the good work you're doing. It's, it's wonderful. Oh, thank you so you much, Jay. Community. I really appreciate Aloha, this Anna. opportunity. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha.